ourselves free. Jesus, you're going to pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask um, our uh, kids to stay in here for just a minute. We will dismiss for children's church and stuff. Go ahead and turn your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. Uh, Romans chapter 6. Um, and if you did not receive an outline in your bulletin um, and you need one, raise your hand and one of our ushers will get you one of those here momentarily. Um, boys and girls, we'll dismiss um, for Children's Church um, here in just a moment. Thank you, youth. Amen. What a blessing they are, and we are grateful for them. Amen. Uh, can't tell you how proud I am of them. Um, before we get started, I um, have some good news to tell you. Anybody like good news? I love good news, Pastor. All right. So it's good news. Um, and so for um, quite some time now, about a year and a half, we have been looking for and searching for a, a worship leader, a worship pastor, um, uh, uh, not just to, to lead in worship, but to do other uh, responsibilities as well. And uh, we have looked at lots of resumes, <laughs> lots of resumes. Um, we have talked to lots of, lots of folks. And um, I, I could go on and on about that and so forth. We have interviewed um, multiple candidates uh, we've even been close a few times, um, and things uh, have happened that was God's directing, we believe, that didn't allow things to come to, come to uh, fruition. But uh, about two weeks ago, I believe it was, two weeks ago, I lose track of time a little bit, and we had a young man here, uh, from uh, actually from a little town called Leslie, Arkansas. Um, you remember him, his name was Brandon Soche, and his wife, Mary Ann, and uh, they have three kids, ages five three, I believe. Is that right, Mark? Five, three, and a baby. And Nicole's shaking her head. Couldn't remember if it was three or two. And a uh, wonderful uh, family. And uh, we, uh, when it was Brandon and Marianne and their family were here, we got a chance to talk with them. We'd been talking with them, um, seeing if this was a good match. And so uh, we are pleased to announce that we are bringing Brandon and uh, his wife and uh, the family, bringing Brandon before you as a candidate for um, associate pastor of worship and discipleship. And so, yeah, amen. And so here's kind of what that looks like. And here's kind of, let me give you kind of the lowdown, the deal on that. Um, so according to our constitution, we announce it for two weeks that we're going to be doing this in the service. So here's number one. Okay. Uh, number two, we'll announce it again next week for those who aren't here this week. Um, and then we will, Brandon and his wife will be here on the 14th, which is two weeks from today. Um, that happens to be Palm Sunday. Um, and I will explain a little bit more uh, here in just a second about the timing and so forth. But um, so they will be here on that Sunday, the 14th. They'll be here kind of a short amount of time, come in on Saturday, have to leave Sunday afternoon. But we will um, not have adult Sunday school that morning. Um, I haven't even talked about it. We'll look at other things as well, but um, we'll meet here in the sanctuary for just kind of a Q&A and get, give you an opportunity to ask questions of him, and, uh, and I don't know if we'll put his wife on the spot or not, but at least give you a chance to ask, ask questions of him and know, get to know more about him. Um, he will lead worship for us that Sunday, and um, I, per our Constitution, we don't, don't vote on that until the following Sunday. Now... If some of you may have already been one step ahead of me, that next Sunday is Easter. Um, let me just say this. That was not our ideal lay of events. But if we didn't do it, if, if we don't do it this way, it then pushes things out. And Brandon has to let, um, as he, he's a, actually a school teacher right now, uh, teaches music in the school system. Uh, he also leads worship at his church and has been a family minister at his church as well. And so, um, for multiple reasons, the, the way the timing fit, what we are proposing is that Brandon, well, he's already, he is coming on the 14th, but we're proposing then that we vote not during the Easter service or anything, but during the Sunday school hour um, at 9.30, we're, gonna have, we would, we're, we're planning on having breakfast, um, not a full spread, but donuts, muffins, those kind of things on Easter morning at 9.30. Uh, we'll in here answer any other questions that you have. And they give you an opportunity um, as a church family to vote on whether you believe that this is the man that God is calling here for this position. 
Um, let me just say this. Um, that's kind of the plan that we have right now. Um, if, if you believe that is not a good idea the, to vote on Easter and so forth, uh, we do not want to detract anything. What our hope is that we'll take care of that first thing and then we'll worship the Lord um, during the service and be able to put our minds and focus on him um, because that's where it needs to be. Um, one of the reasons we believe Brandon is the right man, uh, he's a young man, um, not quite as young as Mark, um, but he's 31 years old. Um, but uh, uh, one of the reasons is that he has a humble heart and he does not want to do anything uh, ever that detracts from the Lord and from our eyes on the Lord. And so um, uh, we love his heart in that. We love uh, what God, how God has prepared him in lots of different ways, not just musically, but his heart for um, the church, his heart for discipleship, um, and we're excited about this. So there you have it. Um, feel free to come give me some feedback afterwards and so forth, but that's the plan. Um, I hope you understand the timing and the reasoning for that. Um, if, it, if, if you really feel that that's a big problem, come talk to me and, and we'll see. But um, uh, that's the plan and, and that's kind of, uh, we're excited about that. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's been a long time searching and we're, we're good with that. So um, be praying. Um, listen, there's one thing that as a leadership team, as we have sought, and I know sometimes you're wondering, hey, pastor, what's going on and why and why don't we hear anything, whatever. And the reality is sometimes we didn't have anything to hear. And sometimes it was just, you know, we're just plugging along and plugging through. Um, but but we're excited about what God is doing. Amen. Um, so anyway, last week. We, uh, so boys and girls, let me give you boys and girls uh, for, somebody's doing children's church, right? Miss Jillian is, boys and girls, ages four years old to kindergarten, uh, may go to children's church at this time, um, but wanted to let all of you guys hear that announcement. So we're going to be in Romans this morning, and I told you Romans chapter six, we'll be there in just a minute. Um, last week, uh, last week we lo were looking in First Peter chapter two, and we looked at, um, as the apostle Peter um, made a plea to us. It was a plea for purity. Um, I, I, think, I think this needs an amen. In, in our world today, we need purity. Amen? We need purity. Um, uh, in the world, yes, but even in the church. That's what hurts my heart is there is not purity among God's people. And so, lest we get all pious and... Um, holier than thou, and think, yes, pastor, preach it, preach it, preach it, tell the world. Listen, before the world can know, it's got to start in the church. It's got to start here. It's got to start with us. And so Peter pled, pled with us to abstain, to, to stay away from fleshly lusts, from those desires of the flesh which so easily ensnare us. And uh, those thoughts and desires and actions that keep us from being where we need to with God and keep us from how God wants us to live. Last week, as we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, we talked about the why. Why should we abstain from fleshly lust? Because we're not of this world. Because there's a war going on within us. And because, friends, that, that God, He wants us to be pure to proclaim His name to a lost and dying world. We talked about the why last week. Some of you may have been saying, but pastor, I, listen, no, as hard as I try, I still slip up. I still mess up. Uh, I think this morning what I want us to do is I want us to talk about the how. I want us to talk about the how. How do I do this, pastor? I try, but I, I continue to fail and I continue to, to, to fall short. Well, I want to put a verse here on the screen that is the short answer. So uh, most of the time we kind of walk through this, and I, I'm going to give you the short answer right now. The short answer Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, is this. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if we want to remain pure, how do we do that? We walk in the Spirit. So you may have a good understanding of what that is. I would guess that some don't. I mean, for that walking in the Spirit, man, that's kind of very mystical. How do we walk in the Spirit? What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, fortunately for us in Romans chapter 8, I believe the Apostle Paul kind of lays that out for us. Um, before we get to chapter 8, I want you to look at Romans chapter 6 where I asked you to turn because the Apostle Paul gives us a similar plea in Romans chapter 6 that, um, that Peter did last week. 
Uh, Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Paul writes, he says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't let it have dominion in your flesh, in your body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Friends, we sang. I love the the songs that the youth led us in this morning. We sang over and over and over again this morning how we are, in many different ways, how we're buried with Christ in his death. Amen? What does that mean? We're going to talk about that this morning. It means that, that, that our sin is buried, that our old life is buried in Christ, and we've been risen to a new life in Christ. Here's what that means. We're saying this morning that the resurrected king is resurrecting me. Listen, there is a sense in which that is completely already true and done. Positionally, um, you, can put, you can take it to the bank. It's done. If you are in Christ, you've already been resurrected. But there's also a sense in which we still live in these fleshly bodies, right? And so we still have to put to death the the, the flesh and we have to let Christ continually resurrect us here on the earth, if you will. Um, And that's a struggle, amen? It's a struggle. Turn over. Um, Paul goes on there in in Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 to talk about this more. But look at chapter 7. Verse 15, we talked last week that one of the reasons why we need to abstain from the the, the fleshly lust and one of the reasons we need to remain pure is because Paul, or because there is a struggle going on inside of us. Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and the two are contrary to one another. Um, Look at verse 15 of Romans chapter 7. Um, I love this passage. Um, It may be confusing to you, but I love this passage because what I believe this passage, in this passage, what Paul is doing is Paul is giving us insight into his own struggle. I believe the Apostle Paul, who many believe to be one of the great, greatest of the faith of all time, is letting us inside his struggle. Look at what he writes. Romans 7, verse 15. He says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. Anybody been there before? I don't know why. Pastor, I don't know why I do what I do. You know, I try not to, but I I mess up. I do it anyway. Look at what he says. For what I will to do or what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, or what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Anyway, if I, if I do what I don't want to do, I'm proving that the, that's the reason we need the law, right? Because <laughs> I need, need something to keep me in place. But now, verse 17, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will or to want to is present with me, but, underline this, how to perform what is good I do not find. Paul makes a very important statement there. How how to abstain from fleshly lust, how to remain pure, he says, I don't find within me. That's what we're going to answer. That's what we're going to talk about. That's what he goes on in chapter 8 to answer for us. Verse 19, though, says this, For the good that I will to do, the good that I want to do, I do not do. But the evil that I don't want to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will or don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Now, you may say, and some people say, well, pastor, of course, we're sinners. We know we're sinners by nature and by choice. That's why we need to be saved. Yes, that's why we need to be saved. And listen, Paul is not here just laying out the fact that we are sinners. He's already laid that fact out back in Romans chapter 3. He's already, he's already made that case. The case that he's making here is against those who say that, that once we're saved, we should never sin again. Well, we should try not to sin, amen? But what what Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying here, I find a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. 
He goes on to talk about the struggle. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. That's, I want to do what God wants me to do. Amen? But, verse 23, I see another law warring in my members. Uh, another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So here Paul goes back and forth. Listen, I, 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 I'm not doing what I want to do and I'm doing what I don't want to do and I don't understand why. And even when I want to do this, I don't. And even when I don't want to do that, I do. I don't know if I said all that right, but... Nevertheless, look at what he says in verse 24. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The struggle's real, amen? Who's going to deliver us? Look at verse 25. Praise the Lord. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? It is the Lord Jesus Christ that delivers us from, this, from our sin and, and from this struggle and from this battle. We know, as I've already said, positionally how he delivers us. But how does that happen practically? Friends, how in the, the process of, 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 of sanctification does that work? Well, I believe that's what Paul goes on to talk about here in chapter 8. And I want to give you this morning simply four ways, four components, if you will, to keeping ourselves pure that we see here in chapter 8. Number one, the first one is this. It begins, friends, I believe, with resting fully in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it starts there. Because here, as we've just read, Paul writes about the struggle between the sin, or the flesh and the, and the spirit and how we do that. And, and so... Here's what the devil, once we're saved, once we have truly put our faith and trust in Christ, and once we uh, surrender our heart and our life to him, um, we're saved by his blood, not by what we do. Amen? And so, but, the, but the problem is that when we sin, the devil uses those things to, against us. He uses those things to attack us. And, uh, well, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't do this. Um, if you, if you really love God, then, then you, would, you, would, you would do better in this area. And, and so um, we become defeated and discouraged and, and really not living in the victory that Jesus provides. You say, well, pastor, that keeps me where I need to be. No, that is not the way God wants you to live. Um, and so the first thing that we need to do is we need to rest fully in the finished work of Christ. Look at what verse 1 says. Verse 1 puts it this way. And in context, here he's talking about the warring back and forth. But here he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. A little bit? None. Nada. Nothing. Zilch. Zippo. Any other language that we can say it in, right? None. There's no condemnation. The word condemnation there... um, You know what it really means? There is no damnation. There is no punishment to those who are in Christ Jesus. That deserves an amen, right? That if we are in Christ, if we're trusting in him, if our faith is in what he did on the cross, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Friends, Paul uh, makes it clear. Uh, We feel that because of the battle inside of us, the temptation can be to feel that we're we're condemned or that we are not forgiven, friends. But Paul makes it blatantly clear here that if we are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation on us at all. He goes on in verse 2, and look at what he says. Explain himself a little bit. He says, For... The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What is that? Um, That's simply the law that says, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are now alive with him. Amen? It is that law that that if, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We may not think of that as a law, but Paul here calls it a law. He, he, it is basically a truth of the universe, the way God has, 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 has decreed to act. For the law of the spirit of life 
in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. What is that? That's that law that is spelled out in Romans 6, 23. Uh, For the wages of sin is death. So because we're sinners, we deserve death but, and, and, and separation from God. But the second part of that verse goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So right there in Romans 6, 23, we see both of these laws spelled out. We see the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. Praise God for that. For, look at verse 3, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. Now, this is not talking about either one of those laws, but this here is talking about uh, the Old Testament law in general. Sometimes it speaks specifically the Ten Commandments. Here, I believe what is being referred to is all of the Old Testament commandments and law, all of that, that system uh, of, of law of the Old Testament for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. So, um, God has a perfect standard. Yes, he gives us his Ten Commandments as a, as a general ruling for that. Jesus summed up that in two, in two commandments. But, but that gen, those general commandments are, are God's standard. Um, it doesn't matter which standard you want to measure us by, but what do we do? We always fall short. We always fall short of that. And so... What he's saying here is, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, we always fall short because we are sinners, and we cannot live perfectly up to the requirements of the law. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. God did by sending Christ here on the earth as the God-man says, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He sent him as a man to live a sinless life, to die a gruesome death on the cross, to pay the penalty for your sin and for mine, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the wonderful news. He goes on in verse 4. He says, he did this. Why? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What does that mean? So if we've, turned, if we've repented of our sin, we put our faith and trust in Christ, and therefore have the Spirit of God in us, we'll talk more about that here in just a second, then guess what? We, our sin is covered at the cross. Our sin is placed on Jesus at the cross. When Jesus is righteousness, the moment we do that is placed on us. We are clothed in his righteousness. And therefore, because of that, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. Because of him. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? We need to simply rest in that. Relax in that. You say, but pastor, surely there's something I must do. Friends, there is nothing you can do. All we need to do is simply trust in Jesus, believe with all of our heart, and rest in him. That's the whole point of verses 1 through 4 is there's nothing we can do. Look, verse 3 says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son. There's absolutely nothing we could do. We just need to simply rest in him. And so I believe the first component of living a pure life is to rest in the freedom, in the forgiveness that Christ provides through his finished work on the cross. Um, I know the weather is teasing us today. With It looks nice outside, but it's... It's a little cold. Um, one of the things I enjoy doing when the weather gets a little bit warmer, um, and a couple years ago, I went out and bought a hammock. Anybody here love to just lay in the hammock? Yeah. Thank you, Jagger. All right. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I grew up, um, and we, my aunt had a hammock at her house. They had two trees, two big trees that were positioned perfectly they didn't always have their hammock out but when they did have their hammock out I loved it because I go and lay in the hammock and so forth and so a couple years ago we don't have not only do we not have two trees close enough together we don't have any trees in our yard and so um, by design uh, but anyway amen Um, I don't like to rake leaves so um, there you have it but so I I had to buy one of those stands and so forth for for my hammock but uh, we it's in the backyard, and we move it around as necessary. But the reason I tell you about a hammock is because, can I just say this? There is no graceful way to get into a hammock. Some of, some of you are laughing. You understand what I'm saying? 
there is no graceful way to get into a hammock. You know, um, what you'd like to do is you'd like to go running and just kind of lay backwards and just fall into the hammock, right? But there's that little bit of doubt in your mind is, as I hit that hammock, it's going to go whoop and flip me over or I'm going to land on the ground. And so I've never tried that. Um, but so what do you have to do with a hammock? You have to kind of, you back up to it gently, right? And you grab a hold of it so it doesn't fly out from under you. And you have to just kind of, it's really awkward. You just have to kind of sit down and so forth. But no matter how far you sit, there is that point at which you have to kick your legs up and you just have to rest back in that hammock. You have to trust that the hammock's going to hold you, right? And so, The reason I tell you that is, friends, because that's really what faith is all about. Um, We we still want to be timid. We want to keep a foot on the ground or we want to hold on to something as we're we're leaning back in the Lord Jesus Christ and so forth. But here's what, listen, what Jesus did on the cross is sufficient for your sin. It is enough. And so what do we need to do? You need to just kick back and rest in him just like I love to rest in the hammock. Amen. Rest in the finished work of Christ. That's the first component of of letting um, uh, of, of, of abstaining, keeping from uh, those fleshly lusts. But but that's not it. Number two, once we are resting fully in the finished work of Christ. And let me just say this. If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you say, Pastor, how do I do that? Since, friends, it is simply recognizing you're a sinner Believing with all your heart that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and rose from the grave. And realizing you can't save yourself, you have to rest and trust fully in him. Allowing him to come into your heart and your life. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to be a child of God. That's what it means to be um, forgiven. Okay, Because when we do that, we put our faith and trust in him. God says he wipes our sin away as far as the east is from the west. And so you can, you say, Pastor, I don't know, I'd love to rest in the work of Christ. You can do that today. By simply letting him come in your life. That's that's the first component. Number two, the second component, friends, not only do we need to rest fully in the work of Christ, but we need to renew uh, our mind regularly on the word of God. We need to renew our mind regularly in the word of God. Uh, Look at what verse 5 says here. Look at what Paul says in verse 5. Paul continues on, he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Your mama ever told you, get your mind out of the gutter. Right? Um, That's what I think of when I read that. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Minds are not on the things of God, right? Right? If we're living in the flesh, our mind's on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So if we are a child of God, what should we set our minds on? Things of the flesh or things of the Spirit? The Spirit, of course. So let me ask you a question. Then why so often do we put our mind on the things of the flesh? Um, we, we, are, we are causing um, problems for ourselves, as we talked about last week. Listen, this is basically the old, ad, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, right? Remember that? It's an old computer term, right? Okay? Uh, Mark, this was back when computers were big and everything. And, um, they said, garbage in, garbage out. In other words, you know, or, or it, it's, it's a mathematics uh, term, too, that if you have the wrong equation, you're going to get the wrong answer, right? If you not, don't have the right input, then you're not going to get the right output. Well, friends, the same thing is true in our lives. If we fill our minds with trash, if we fill our minds with, with, with junk, then it's going to be harder to do what Paul and Peter are pleading with us to do, and that is to remain pure, to stay away from fleshly lusts, to avoid the desires of the flesh. Look at what he says in verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. So just in case you think, well, pastor, I think I'll take my chances. Well, he goes on to say, listen, you think you can just live there? Here's what he's really saying is then you're fooling yourself. And if you think you can live there and that's where your mind is and you want to keep your mind in the gutter and you don't want to put your mind on the things of of the spirit and the word of God and get into the word of God and read the word of God and let the word of God feed you on a regular daily basis, friends, then, 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 then you're fooling yourself. 
You're fooling yourself. And Jesus Christ is not, may not really be Lord of your life. Because if he is Lord of our life, then we follow what he says. And we live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. For to be carnally minded, what the word carnal there simply means fleshly. It's the same word, sarks. It's the, it's carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity. The fleshly mind is hatred against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. It is not submissive to the law of God. Um, you ever found yourself, your heart being hard, and you're saying, I know what God wants me to do, but I don't care. You're in the flesh. You're in the flesh. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So um, we need to be careful what we allow into our minds. We need to get in the word of God, not be in the flesh, not fill our minds with junk and all sorts of other things that are going to be contrary to the spirit because the two don't mix well. I want to show you a picture. I want to show you a picture of two rivers. Um, these, this picture here looks kind of odd, doesn't it? You say, well, pastor, what is it? These are actually two rivers coming together as one. The river on the left is the Rhone River, R-H-O-N, not the Rhine, but the Rhone River. Originates in the Swiss Alps at an elevation of 6,000 feet, comes down, goes into Lake Geneva, and then comes out of Lake Geneva and this is somewhere just south of Geneva, Switzerland. The other river, the river on the right, is the Arve River. Originates from the glaciers of Mont Blanc. And because of such, has a high silt content. And so here, as you can see, these two rivers come together as one, but they have a difficult time mixing. Now why is that? They have a difficult time mixing because... Um, this may not be the right terminology for a river, but I will put it this way, because they have two natures, if you will, that are trying to mix. One with a high silt level, the Arve on the right, and, and, and the Rhone on the left that is coming out of a lake and is a lot um, uh, where the silt is not, it, it's had a chance to settle to the bottom. And so... Um, uh, they have a hard time mixing together, and you see where it, it looks like you've just kind of drawn a line right there. Here's what I want you to think of when you remember that picture. That is the spirit and the flesh. Such is the case with the spirit and the flesh. Um, they don't mix well. Um, and so they have a hard time mixing. Friends, that's why we need to not feed our minds a bunch of junk, thus working against the spirit of God. And instead, why we need to renew our minds daily, regularly in the Word of God. Friends, listen, this is how God speaks to us today primarily. Amen? And so I want to encourage you, make it a habit of being in the Word regularly. Um, Laura and I have kind of been talking about this. I, I don't have anything to kind of say we're going to do this yet. How many of you remember several years ago we had kind of a, a reading contest between the guys and the girls. Y'all remember that? All right. A few of you do and so forth. Um, Awana now is having a competition for the boys and the girls. And so um, Laura and I have been talking about this, uh, about possibly having maybe a Bible reading contest between the guys and the girls. I don't know. Guys, who would win? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I think just because of that, guys, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, anyway. Um, here's what I want to encourage you, friends. Give your body daily the spiritual food it needs. Make it a habit of being in the Word. I want to give you some time. Make it a habit. We provide our daily bread around. There are numerous number of apps, including the Bible app and lots of other devotional apps as you can get on your phone to do that, or you can pick up your Bible and start reading chapter by chapter, okay? Um, however you determine to do it, friends, get in the Word, allow, because here's the deal. Um, who wrote this Bible? God did, that's right. They're uh, written over a period of about 15, 1,600 years um, by 40 different men, but the Holy Spirit speaking through those men. And so if the Holy Spirit inspired the men who wrote the Bible. 
And now the Holy, same Holy Spirit seeks to take the Word of God, as the Scripture tells us, and make it alive in our lives and speak to us through it, then we are doing ourselves a disservice to not be reading and memorizing and be in the Word of God. Amen? We need, friends, to regularly renew our mind in the Word of God. Number three, the third component I want to talk to you about that Paul brings out here in verse eight, friends, is to trust the Holy Spirit to do his work in you. Trust the Holy Spirit within you to do his work. Look at verse nine. He continues on, he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So listen, you are in the spirit if you have been saved and you're a child of God. You are in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you. Look at what he says. He says, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Uh, this is to counter what some, pe- some churches teach, and some people might say, some people might say, well, pastor, maybe I'm saved, I just don't have the Spirit. Not possible. The Scripture is very clear, this being one of the main verses here, that if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So friends, when you get saved, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, you have the Spirit of God living in you. Uh, So if, it may mean, what you may take from this is that you need to get saved. You need to surrender your life to Christ. If all you hear is the flesh, if all you hear are your own lusts and desires and passions and, and drive want, telling you what to do, and you don't hear the Spirit of God, I'm not talking about your conscience. Of course, you may have seared that by now, but, but I'm not talking about your conscience. I'm talking about the flesh. If all you hear and you don't hear the Spirit of God calling you to righteousness, calling you to follow Christ, then maybe you need to ask that question. But what is, tr- what is true here is that if you are a Christian, if you are a believer, you have the Spirit of Christ living in you. Look at verse 11, 10. Excuse me. It says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. We already talked about that. The wages of sin is death, right? You say, but pastor, I still live in my physical body. My body's not dead. Well, as Paul writes earlier in in Romans, uh, he says, Reckon yourselves indeed dead to sin, but alive to God. When Jesus, when we were united with Christ in salvation, we died to our old self, our old life. We've been risen to a new life in Christ. That's what he's talking about here. The body is dead because of sin, so you might as well consider this physical body dead. Why live for this physical body? Because God has already forgiven you. He's already saved you from it. Therefore, why live for it? The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, here in verse 10, the word spirit there, and if you've got the New King James is what I preach out of here. If you have that, um, the word spirit is capitalized. In some translations, the word spirit is not capitalized. Why is that, Pastor? Let me tell you why. It is the Greek word pneuma means spirit, okay? And in some cases, it does refer to the Holy Spirit of God. Many cases in this own passage here, it refers to the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, most places in this passage, when it just talks about the Spirit, it's talking about the Spirit of God. But there are quite a lot of times in the New Testament where the word pneuma also refers just to a person's spirit. I believe in the context of verse 10 here, it is not talking about the Holy Spirit of God, but as some other translations say, it should be a small s and it's talking about our spirit. Either way, the meaning is very similar. But what it's saying here then is, if that's the case, righteousness, because of what Christ has done for you and the righteousness that has been accounted to you, you are already alive and going to live forever with him. Amen? Your spirit has been risen from the dead. And positionally, you are already risen with Christ. Look at verse 11. I believe he goes on one more time. This is the third time in three verses he said something similar like this. He said in verse 9, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Verse 10, and if Christ is in you. Verse 11, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. In other words, he wants you to examine, are you saved? He's saying, if you're saved... These are the things that are true in your life. 
If you're saved, you have the Spirit of God living in you. If you're saved, uh, you have already been risen to a new life in Christ. It's going to last for eternity. And here in verse 11, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. In other words, friends, it's interesting here how when he uses the word bodies, he wants no confusion at all, but he adds the word mortal there. Meaning he is absolutely speaking about our physical bodies here in verse 11. So what he's saying is if Jesus, if the spirit of Jesus lives in us, the Holy Spirit lives in us, then he who raised Christ from the dead will not only take your soul to heaven, but he will do a work in your life now. He will work in your physical body to make you who he wants you to be and to purify you and to sanctify you and to set you apart unto him. The Holy Spirit is in your life and he, friends, is working. We just need to trust that he's at work in us. Um, I don't know if you've ever refinished furniture before or, or maybe refinished any kind of painted wood. Um, but if you do, they make a liquid paint remover um, that does wonders. And uh, here's, here's the key, though. When you use the liquid paint remover to take paint off of painted wood, um, you have to either you spray it on or, or put it on with a brush or what have you. The temptation is to try to start scraping right away. Doesn't work that way, does it? What do you have to do? You have to let it sit. Let the chemicals in the remover loosen the paint and, and loosen that paint from the wood. And if, you, if it works properly and you do it right, and, and, and I guess it's a good product, then you take your scraper and then it will scrape off. But the key is you have to let the remover actually work on the paint. Friends, in a very similar way, the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. As we respond to him, As we allow him to do his work in us, as we cooperate with him, friends, um, he directs us and guides us and works on us and in us. Amen? Uh, The key is we have to trust and allow the Holy Spirit to do his work, friends. We need to lean on him and let him lead us and guide us and direct us. Amen? And it brings us right to number four. And this is the last thing we're going to talk about this morning is, friends, we need to listen to him. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit who is at work leading us in our lives. we got to listen to him. Verse 12 says this, Therefore, brethren, therefore, because of all that he said here, we are debtors. Now, we're debtors to whom? Are we debtors to the flesh? No, he says not to the flesh. To live according to the flesh? Well, we're not in debt to the flesh. What did the flesh ever do for us other than get us into trouble? Amen? It just got us into trouble. Verse 13 tells us it leads to death. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So we're not debtors to the flesh. But by implication, we are debtors to what? The Spirit. We are debtors to Christ because of what He's done for us. He died to forgive us for our sins. He died to pay the debt that we could not pay. So, therefore... It says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, underline by the Spirit, if by the Spirit, the Spirit's work in our life, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In other words, friends, if you will allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in your life and you will cooperate with Him. Uh, you see, some people want to, I'm not going to get too theological here, uh, but here's, here's what I believe the Scripture teaches. I believe the Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit works in our life, and it is God who convicts us, and God who draws us, and God who does the work in this. However, I also believe that we have to respond to the Holy Spirit. That we have to cooperate with Him, and we have to allow Him to work in our heart and in our lives for, as He sanctifies us. And how exactly all of those two things work together, listen, I, we're not going to know till glory comes. But I know as a whole, I need to let the Holy Spirit work in my life, and I need to cooperate with Him and listen to Him as He seeks to lead me. Friends, our job is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, listen to what He has to say, and respond as He speaks. So here's kind of how that works. It says, uh, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. So what's, what's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit? One of His jobs or one of His responsibilities is to convict us of sin. So as the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin... 
What is our job? To listen and to repent of our sin, right? Not to resist him, not to ignore him, but we're to, we're to listen to him. And when he convicts us of our sin, we are to respond with repentance, respond with godly sorrow. Let God do his work in us. When the Holy Spirit seeks to lead us and guide us into right living, what are we to do? We are to follow. We are to do what he tells us to. When he says stop, we're to stop. When he says go this way, we're to go that way. When he says you need to let me have control of this area of your life, we need to let him have control. We, uh, how we live the life here, friends, is we let the Holy Spirit of God lead us and we are sensitive to what he has to say to us. Verse 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So if we're a child of God, we have the Spirit of God leaving, living in us and we're going to let the Spirit of God lead us and guide us and direct and we're going to listen to him. We're going to be sensitive to what he has to say to us. Let me, let me explain just a little bit what I'm talking about before we wrap it up this morning. See, the type of relationship we need to have with the Holy Spirit uh, is similar. I'm probably making a lot of analogies here, but it's similar to the type of relationship um, a race car driver has with his race car. Let me explain. How many of you remember or know who Daryl Waltrip is? Ever heard of Daryl Waltrip before? Famous uh, NASCAR race car driver. Um, Now he's an announcer and so forth. Three-time Winston Cup champion. He was quoted in an article several years ago saying this. He said, back when I was still racing, racing, can I talk like Daryl Waltrip? Is that okay? Back when I was still racing, when something was wrong or something was happening with my car, I could sense it. He went on to say, if my car was starting to act up, my senses would come alive. I'm probably not going to do a good job of saying it. He said, I could smell it. I could hear it in the changing tone of the engine. I, as I went into the pit, the crew chief would ask, what's wrong? He'd say, it's, I'd say, it's getting ready to blow up. The crew chief would say, are you sure? He'd say, yep. He said, I've driven for people who wouldn't believe me. I'd have to let the car blow up before they did. He said, several times I had the crew actually pull an engine out of a car when it was running fine. What's wrong, they'd ask. He'd say, I don't know, but something is. They'd pull the engine, he'd say, you, and they would say, you're right. They find out later that we were scuffing a pigeon or pinch, blah, blah, blah. scuffing a piston. You notice I don't know all these car terms. Losing a lobe and a camshaft, or the rod bearings were about to fly out of the thing. And then he closed with this statement. He said, "When you're in tune with your car, it speaks to you, and you listen." I would tend to guess that you've been driving your car and you've heard a little clink or a clank or something, and you're like, mm, "Something's not right." Friends, when we're in tune with the Spirit of God, we hear Him speaking to us. We're listening for Him speaking to us. That's the problem. When we're in the flesh, we're not even listening. Many times we don't even care what God has to say. God may have to do something drastic to get our attention, and He will. We need to be sensitive to what He has to say, friends, and what He wants to do in our life. I want to do one other thing before we close this morning. Uh, I need, um, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recruit two volunteers, okay? Um, one volunteer, um, Chris, get you here for just a minute. Um, Phil, if I can get you, borrow you for just a minute. Chris, if you can come, just, all I need you to do, brothers, I need you to just stand right here, okay? Here we have Bubba Gump, all right? So there we go. Thank you, brother. Phil, if you'll come up here and stand on the other side, I would appreciate that. You stand about right here, all right? And so, uh, those of you who don't know, this is Phil. Say hi, Phil. (laughs) Most everybody knows Phil. Those of you who don't know, this is Chris. Everybody say hi, Chris. Chris is going to stand here, and he's going to represent the Holy Spirit in my life. I know, that's that's a big role, Chris, all right? Can, I, I need you to live up to that, okay? So there we go. All right. And if Chris is the Holy Spirit, then what Phil is going to represent <laughs> is my flesh. All right? So we have the flesh and we have the Spirit of God. And so as I am living my life, as we've already talked about this morning, there's a war going on inside of us. And, 
and what I want to do, I don't do often and so forth. But um, here's kind of the deal. I get drawn. The, spirits, the Spirit of God is seeking, is leading me and guiding me and telling me. And the flesh is also, it's pulling me and it's, it's speaking to me as well. And here's what I want you to notice is that when I listen to the flesh, the flesh says something to me. It is as if I am taking a step closer. So let me ask you this question. As I continue to do what the flesh wants me to do and I continue to listen to the flesh, then what's happening between me and the Spirit? There's dis- distance. And it's becoming harder for me to hear what the Spirit has to say to me. Okay? You understand where I'm going with this? Okay? Now, as I... Maybe God does something, you know, if we get too far over here and we're a believer, guess what? You say, well, then is God just going to let me go? Listen, if you're a true believer, God's going to, he's going to do something to get your attention. Okay? You say, so one of the reasons we don't walk over here is because because God's going to do something to get your attention. He's not going to continue to let you walk in the flesh. And the scripture even says, whole different text and whole different thing this morning, that if we go too far, that God may just take us because he, because we just continue to refuse to walk with him. Okay? But if I'm listening to the Spirit and I'm being attentive to the Spirit and I'm sensitive to what the Spirit has to say in my life, then what, what's happening with my relationship with the flesh? I'm putting more distance between me and the flesh. Now you say, that's hard, Pastor. We're still in the flesh. You're right. We are still in the flesh. This is just an analogy here, okay? What I'm trying to relate to you, that's exactly what Paul was writing in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, that walk in the Spirit... Walk in the Spirit. That means walk with the Spirit. Let the Spirit lead you and guide you. The other phrase is used in Scripture this morning. It says, when we are led by the Spirit, when the Spirit is telling me what to do, and I'm listening to the Spirit, and I'm, I'm responding to the Spirit, and I'm letting the Spirit lead me, when we walk in the Spirit, when we are led by the Spirit, when we're filled with the Spirit, and what that means is simply that we let Him permeate every area of our lives we don't keep something back from God but we let him have uh, reign in every area of our life walk in the spirit and you shall not do what fulfill the lusts of the flesh so you see most people misunderstand the Christian life and they think well I've got a lot of do's and don'ts that I need to do I need to do this do this do this do this and not do this 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 and this when Jesus says all we need to do is love God with all your heart soul mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself and here's what how we do that is simply by listening to this guy listening to the Holy Spirit in our lives thank you guys appreciate it Friends, here's the deal. And the question I want to ask you simply this morning is this. Number one, are you resting in the finished work of Christ? If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, that's the step that you need to take. Believe that he died for you and rose again. Turn from your sin. Ask him to forgive you and let him have control of your life. If you've done that, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you can relate to that struggle going on. I want to, are you walking in the Spirit? And if not, when we get too far this way, how do we get back? The Spirit's still going to be calling. You, it may be a faint, but here's what we need to do. Yes, Lord. You're right. I'm sorry, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, please forgive me for that. Lord, how in the world can I live, live for the flesh How could I get out of where I need to be, Lord? Forgive me. Forgive me. And we begin to come back to where God wants us to be, letting the Spirit of God lead us, doing away with the flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for saving us, dying for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful provision of your Holy Spirit to live in our hearts and in our lives. To lead us, to guide us, to speak to us, to talk to us, to illuminate your word to us. Lord, help us to be in your word on a regular basis. Lord, help us to daily come to you seeking what you have to say to us. Lord, help us have a heart to listen. Help us to respond to you as you speak to us, whether that is turning from our sin, 
whether it is surrendering to something that you want us to do, Lord, whether that is talking to others about you, whether it is being a kinder, gentler person to others, those around us, whether it is being a better husband, a better wife, being a better father, mother. Lord, whatever it is, may we listen and walk in your spirit each and every day. Lord, forgive us where we fail you. Forgive us where we sin. Lord, draw us closer to you each and every day and to your spirit and to the life that you have died to give us. It is in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, maybe you're here this morning and there's some repentance that needs to go on in your life. I want to invite you. Maybe you just want to stay right there in your seat and stay seated, bow your head and do business with God. Maybe you want to come and